Hi, and thanks for joining us for another episode of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And I'm very pleased to have a guest, Laura Greenfield, who's not only a former volunteer here at WHU-TV, but is also a wine lover, professional writer, and who knows, she might be writing about us someday. So I thanks so. for joining us, Laura. <laughs> Thank you. You're in for a treat. Make us famous. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so tonight, Bob, we're going to be discussing mm -hmm. wines from Portugal. Uh, as you know, I took a job with Sarmento's Imports in Boston, and I've brought a couple of the wines that we sell in the Boston area down to Connecticut. Uh, and I did this tonight because these are now finally available here in Connecticut. Yeah, we saw them today, actually. We did. We teamed up with a company called Iberian Imports here in Connecticut, and they have actually put these on the shelf at Maximum Beverage here in West Hartford. So these are available, if you're, if you're looking for them, uh, right, right, right around the corner here. Yeah, and they're probably available in a couple other shops in the area, yep. too. So that's uh, good for West Hartford and good for me. Yeah. So I know Portugal, Portuguese wine is really popular right now. It is. It's where the value is in the wine world. You get so much quality for such a low price. Uh, part of the reason for this is that Portugal got hurt especially hard during the recession, uh, more so than any of the other nations in Europe. And so they're just kind of giving their wine away right now. Uh, you get such a great value on these when you go to the retail store. I think uh, a couple of years from now, you'll pay 5 or $6 more per bottle than you're paying right now. So if you find something you like, Stock up a little on it, not a whole lot, because some, the wines we're going to drink tonight are meant to be drunk young. Uh, so I, I don't recommend buying these and putting them away for five or six years. Um, but if you do fall in love with it and you intend on drinking a lot of it, um, go ahead and, and buy in quantity. And Laura, you said you haven't had much experience with uh, Portuguese no, wine? No, I haven't had any to my knowledge. Just yeah. Portuguese people? Yeah. All right. Well, that's good. <laughs> very well you're nice. in for a real treat yeah. tonight. Uh, these are wines that I, I talk about all the time. So these, these are really fun. Uh, they have a lot in mm -hmm. common, too. Uh, they're all Portuguese. Uh, the first three that we're going to drink are the wines that I represent. Um, the, the first three are also on the wine enthusiast best buy list. And again, that just means you're getting a lot of quality for a very low price. And they're all priced under $10. Uh, now, the last one we're going to try is, I think, uh, in the $12 to $14 yeah, range. Yeah, 12 to 14 and, uh, uh, But still very affordable. Very affordable. And, uh, Jim, I want to thank you again, even before we start, for bringing these wines down. I know uh, uh, I've sampled a couple of these previously, and I just fell in love with them. And thanks for bringing them down they're, to the show. They're great wines. And I, honestly, this show is part of the reason I got this job with this distributor. Yeah, he saw the, a couple of the episodes that we did, uh, especially the Portuguese episode, and he said, you're the right guy to be talking about these wines. So Awesome. Let's see if the Portuguese so. <laughs> wine is, is right for our tongue. So what are we drinking first? So we're going to start off with Paval Vino Verde. Now, Vino Verde is a region in the northwest corner of Portugal. And... It's known for producing very light style wines that have just a little bit of effervescence. So when you look at the wine in the bottle, you'll notice it's got a little bit of bubble to it. So the Pavao is made up of three grape varietals, Lorero, Trajadura, and Paderna. So in the area of Portugal, this is a cooler side or lighter side uh, temperature climate wise? It's, well, it's right by the ocean. So you get a lot of salt air coming in. Um, you, yes, yeah, so you get a little ocean breeze. It's a little Little so th this there. should be a little minerally then? It's, you're going to get some minerality, you're going to get some acidity, uh, a lot of citrus. Now with Vino Verdes, there can be up to 20 different grape varietals that can go into a Vino Verde. Um, and, and sometimes the, the winemakers don't put the varietals on the bottle. Uh, sometimes they don't even know what they're growing. You know, you look at uh, some of these winemakers and they've just been growing the same thing for generation after generation. They don't even know what it is. Well, I know when Laura's looking at that wine, she goes, I need that wine. All right, so, try it. Go ahead. Right, 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 enough talk. I didn't want to throw <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, that little effervescence. You get that, Laura, that little, almost like a Prosecco oh, it is. or a little mm -hmm. bubbly. Mm -hmm. It's light, it's crisp, it's got a great bubble to it. Really fun wine for the summertime. Uh, it's lower in alcohol than a lot of other wines. Yeah, that's so important, that's right. It is, so if you're out in the sun drinking this, you can drink a little bit more of it, or you can drink the same amount you normally would and not worry about the, the sun zapping you. And I, I should, we should emphasize that uh, this is best chilled. Yes, you want to get this really cold. And you can also serve this in place of a Prosecco. If you're doing a Mimosa or a Bellini, um, because it's got a little bubble to it, you know, you can just pour in a little orange juice or uh, a little bit of peach nectar. Besides having said the bottle being really, really a pretty bottle, mm -hmm. um, I think it translates to a really nice, attractive flavor. And uh, the effervescence in it really goes with, you know, you're going to be seeing this show, I think, in September. I'm not sure how one is going to be airing, but this will still be ready to be drunk in September and October. Absolutely, yeah. I, you know, I drink a lot of Sauvignon Blanc throughout the year. Um, I've 
served this in place of Sauvignon Blanc in a lot of different occasions, and I will continue to do so throughout the year. You know, I, can, I will drink this into the winter months. What do you think, Laura? Mm. I like it. I think I, I like the effervescence because I'm normally not a really big white wine drinker. Yeah, I heard that a lot uh, lately. Yeah. A lot of times women aren't a huge, it's not a favorite of theirs. No, it's really not, but I like this. Maybe it's the bubbles. Well, that's, that's part <laughs> of it. That's, that's what yeah. makes this wine so versatile is mm -hmm. the bubbles. You know, you can serve this with a really spicy Thai food. Mm. Uh, you can serve this with um, seafood. It goes really well with uh, any kind of shellfish. Um, mm -hmm. they, they, they actually, and they mentioned a uh, good pairing for this is a, a cold fruit soup, a uh, strawberry with mint. Oh. And this, oh, this will offset, that. yeah. What about a gazpacho? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it works with a lot of different kind of foods. Uh, but it drinks yeah. so well on its own, too. I mean, you could just sit down in the backyard and, and have a bottle of this by itself. And because it's lighter in alcohol, once again, it is kind of the perfect mm -hmm. summer wine. Yeah. Especially with the heat. And like I always tell people, and Jim says, you always drink water and stuff when you're outside and you're drinking any type of alcoholic beverage. Wine in particular, if, you, you know, if you're going to be out in the sun, the lower alcohol won't yeah. uh, affect you quite as much. So. And another good idea, uh, if you're trying to, to water down the wine, you can make what's called a spritz. So it's a, a little bit of, um, and I usually do this with Prosecco, but again, you can substitute with the Pavel. A uh, little bit of Pavel, a little bit of uh, club soda, and then just a dash of either Campari or Aperol, some kind of something in the bitters family. Yeah. Very light style. I was thinking that. Yeah. Could you use ice cubes? Yeah, uh, you put that on ice. You could. And could, could you use ice cubes on this just out of the bottle? It's not, you're going to lose some of the I, I hate putting wine on ice i really do but but if you're making a spritz you're supposed to put ice in the glass yeah um but again i i, I know people who sit out in the backyard and they throw ice cubes in the glass and dump the wine in and because they're not drinking it fast enough. yeah <laughs> or, or they're not doing the bobby p rule which if you're going to drink and you want to chill don't fill your glass up to the top yeah fill Just, it about a mouthful mm -hmm. or two and go back to the bottle yeah to me that's the best way to drink yeah. a white wine in the summertime you fill it up either you're going to chug it and that's not good or it's going to get too warm too fast. So take the extra pores. Work out that arm muscle. Very, that's very good advice. <laughs> so I'm giving thumbs up again to the first one. This is a big winner. Yeah, and that's, that's part of the reason why it made Wine Enthusiast Best Buy list. And Laura, thumbs up, thumbs down, halfway. Oh, thumbs up. By the way, you don't have to lie. No guest ever has to lie. If you don't like no, something, you have to hurt anybody. No, it your still opinion. probably wouldn't be, I probably still wouldn't choose a white. But for all of those things that you're saying, I like it. And I love the idea of the spritz. I probably would like it more that way. Yeah. But. I don't mind it. All right, excellent. For, for me, that's a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to move on now to the Pavel Rosé, or as the Portuguese say, Rosado. The Pavel Rosado is 100% Espadero. Now, Pavel actually translates from Portuguese into peacock, and that's why you see the peacock mm -hmm. on the label. This is a very similar wine to what we just had, uh, even though it's a different grape varietal. Um, the, the white that we had is uh, Trajadura, and um, uh, Espero, and this is, a, this is a completely different grape. So when, when we try this, um, it's gonna, you're going to get a familiar taste, but then you're going to get a little touch of strawberry at the end. Yeah, and I, I, I don't think we talked about the bouquet the first time we took our first sip of the uh, Barranco White. This bouquet is a little bit sweeter on the, on the nose. Mm -hmm. It is a tad bit sweeter. The effervescence is there, yeah. and there's the strawberry kicking in just slightly at the end. Right at the end, though. Very it's mild. Not, yeah, it's not overwhelming at all. And that's important for me because I do not like sweet wine. I don't know if you're a sweet wine fan. Not particularly. Right. No. Nothing is worse to me than an overly sweet wine in the summertime. Yeah. So yeah, it's a rosé. It's effervescent. It's not overly sweet. That means it's a winner. Yeah. And remember, it's a rosado. It's a, oh, it's a rosato. <laughs> that's the Portuguese word. A uh, rosato, yes, that's exactly right. Beautiful color, too. Yeah. And again, this is a maximum beverage. Uh, Bob and I were just there before the show, and, and we're pleasantly surprised to see it on the shelf. You know, it, it's interesting because I think, Laura, I don't know if your experience are with rosés. Rosés come in a lot of, uh, rosato, ro they come in a lot of different colors. I, would you call this a medium dark color rosé? Uh, no, it's, I'd, I'd say medium, yeah. Medium? Yeah, because I've, I've seen some that are really dark salmon color. So and does that always mm -hmm. uh, signify a sweeter or more powerful rosé? I usually make that assumption too, but really all it indicates is that the winemaker has left the grape skins in contact with the juice for a longer period of time. Uh, mm. Most rosés, well, the lightest rosés, uh, the skins stay in contact for four hours or six hours, and then they pull the skins out. 
uh, if it's a darker color, it can go up to 48 hours, and then they pull the skins out. So it's, it's a brief amount of time either way. I mean, you're talking a couple hours to two days, but the longer those skins stay in, the, the darker the color gets. And I don't know if we discussed this earlier, but these are screw-off caps, yeah. which a lot of wines are now. And I think you also mentioned these aren't meant to store for long periods. No, you want to drink these this year or next year. Uh, so don't don't buy ten cases and think I'll have vino verde for the next twenty years. Well, unless they're having a party and they want us to go. Yeah. <laughs> so then you can buy as many cases as you want, and we will be there. But you're right. This is strictly uh, a young wine, party yep. wine, um, very inexpensive, and it's great to have for those big groups of people where you want them to give something different than the Kendall Jacksons yeah. and the uh, Two Buck Chucks and so forth. Yeah, you will surprise your friends by serving this. They'll, they'll be mm -hmm. amazed at, at how light and crisp it is, uh, how much bite you get with it, uh, and, and how different it is. It's, it's such a different wine. It's, it's so much fun for the summertime. Especially considering, you know, we've been doing a lot of rosés. I don't know, if, have you had a lot of rosés this summer? Not at all. Well, shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> rosés are everywhere, Laura. You should be drinking them. I guess so. Well, well they are everywhere now. <clears throat> yeah, they've really exploded. But and, you and, I, and it's all because you and I have been promoting them. Uh, since, <laughs> since 2011, the yeah. WHE TV Gala, I believe. Yeah. That's right. But this rosé is really unique only because of the effervescence. And sure, you can buy a champagne or a sparkling. That's a rosé. Mm -hmm. But you're going to pay a little bit more for that. Right. This is a very nice sort of entry level into that sparkling type feeling yep. of a rosé in a Vino Verde type uh, yep. bottle. So another winner. Nice. Under $10. Can't beat it. You cannot beat That's that. That's always good. And it's everything good. here, when you say from Portugal, so these are imported, obviously. Yep. And um, from your experience up in Boston, they are just coming to the state now, or they've been here for a while? Oh, they've been here for quite a while. They're, uh, they're just coming here to Connecticut, but they've been in Boston for quite a while. Yeah, the, the company I work for has been in business 30 years. Okay. Now, we do have some cheese and crackers on the table, and generally we sometimes will eat those between wine. But I think uh, we're going to move right into the next red because that's what I've been wanting to taste here. Because I haven't tried this one. You have, right. but I haven't. Well, I know Laura has it. All right. So the next one, this is from the Dow region. You know, we started off in the Vino Verde region, which is up in the northwest corner of the country. And now we're moving south, uh, I'd say probably north central Portugal. This is where the Dal region is. And this is a red blend. And uh, this is very mm. typical of Portuguese wines. They, they have uh, over 200 different grape varietals that are indigenous to Portugal that don't really get planted anywhere else in the world. Uh, and so that's why here in the United States, you know, everyone's familiar with those six noble grapes that we talked about a couple episodes ago, where you've got, you know, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, the Pinot Noir, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay. Everyone knows those grape rattles. Even though mm -hmm. those, are, those are French names, uh, people can rattle those off here in the United States. You start talking about Triga Nacional, uh, Arento, some of these other grape varietals that are native to Portugal, no one's heard of them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a little, it can be a little daunting if you're just looking for grape varietals. I did not know that. Yeah. And my best Johnny Carson. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love the color on this. It's really nice. Very dark color. Great nose. Very, very mild nose. Hmm. I did not expect that. A little peppery up front. A little peppery, a little tannin. It finishes soft, though. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Laura? I like that. A little bite Favorite in the beginning. so far, but I'm And then a little, biased, little soft at the end. I yeah. like it. It was just mild. I thought it was just... And I think this is, a lot of taste this is it. typical of a Portuguese wine. Mm -hmm. You know, you, it's an old world style. Uh, you don't get a whole lot of fruit up mm. front. It's not that California style where it's just this giant fruit bomb. Right, you know, right. It's, uh, but at the same time, it's not overly tannic. Uh, you don't get a lot of tannins with this. It's, it's not drying my mouth out. Um, you know, you're I right. Mm -hmm. I snuck a piece of cheese just a moment ago, and I wanted to mm -hmm. taste it with the red. I like it for summer. And that's, mm -hmm. that's, you can really, that, it actually changes the flavor completely of this red. It, with a piece of cheese, it's sort of mild from the beginning. Sort of it neutralizes the, the boldness up front. It does. You lose a little of that pepperiness, yep. which is, can be good or bad depending on what your preference is. I like the little pepper bite in the beginning. I sort of like that little kick yeah. right in the beginning. Yep. And I also like mm -hmm. the mild finish at the end. And to me, that signifies a good drinking wine for the summer that's not overly complex and is sort of fighting inside your mouth. And is it, what's the alcohol content on this one? Oh, I see, uh, it's 13%. 13, okay. Never would have guessed that with the flavor. Yeah. It doesn't taste like a 13% red. Very interesting. I what like did you that think? a lot. 
So that's another go-to for you? That's two thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> two thumbs up? Have we ever had two thumbs up guests before? Not a guest, no. No, okay. No, you and I have done two thumbs up. <laughs> Actually, we didn't even talk about should this breathe for a bit? If you're in these reds, breathe. Uh, yes, with Portuguese reds, you want them to breathe a little bit. Now, we just popped this right before the show. Uh, and this is, a, this is a wine that doesn't need a whole lot of air, uh, but there are some of the other wines I represent that need to breathe for a good half hour or so, or to be decanted. Now, is there a vintage year on this particular one? Uh, I don't think so. Is this another one that could be, should be drank fast also? Yes, this is this? another one you want to drink young. Uh, you can mm. store it for up to five years, but, but you want to drink this fairly early. So five years would probably yeah. be the max on yeah. that. i got to say, I, I was really surprised, um, since I haven't tasted this one, I know you have, right up front with the mild bouquet, the peppery bite in the beginning and the, and the sort of neutral finish. And uh, it's one of those kind of reds where I think for my taste, especially in the summertime, I would be drawn to because of how you eat. Sometimes you don't eat as heavy in the summertime if you're mm -hmm. outside especially, mm -hmm. yeah. which obviously, you know, look at me, I'm always outside. So I don't want anything that's too heavy. Um, and that, that would fit right perfectly into my little niche there for what I like for a price point and, and a red wine. Yep. So. Yeah, under $10. Mm -hmm. Pairs well with stuff mm -hmm. off the grill. You know, if you're if you're outside doing a little barbecue. Mm -hmm. Well, thumbs up for me. Thumbs up for two I thumbs up. I, I have to give a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> now this one is also available in Connecticut now. Uh, Iberian Imports is bringing this in for us. Uh, I did not see it at Maximum Beverage, but that doesn't mean they can't get it. Yeah. Uh, you know, and like I've always said for every episode we've done, you know, if there's a wine you're looking for. Uh, and you don't see it on the shelf at your retailer, just ask them to order it. Uh, they can get in, you know, if it's available here in Connecticut, they can order it and get it within a week or so. Yeah, and it, once again, it's definitely one that you want to look into because for the price point and for the flavor profile, uh, I think it's really good. Yeah. Really good. So thanks, Jim. All right, you're welcome. So our, our, our next one, I think, is sort of a, uh, a newbie. Yes. For a Portuguese yes. wine. Yes, this is something none of us have tried. This is, uh, we're breaking my rule. We bought it before we tried it. Uh, but this is from the Douro region, and when you look at a map of Portugal, uh, the Douro region is north of Dao, which is where the last wine was from. Uh, so it's, it's up in uh, north central Portugal. And this is going to be kind of reminiscent of some of the ports that come from Portugal. It's, it's a little heavier, a little thicker. Well, I'm, I have to say, I think I must have offended Jim earlier because look at that little pour that he gave me compared to the little bit bigger pour that he got. <laughs> so I hope I can get all the characteristics that we're talking about here. I, I'm sure I'll be pouring more for you. <laughs> that's a bigger nose right off the bat than the first one. Mm -hmm. And actually, did we check the... Uh, yeah, that's another 13%. Yeah. Wow, completely different, huh, Laura? Definitely. That to me that is sort of a one note. Sweet. It's sort of neutral right yeah. from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. And it's very dry. Drier, yes. I get I still get a little bit of pepper with this, but it's not as pronounced as the, the Odaka that we just had. I'm trying to think um, how you would pair that because of its once again, this is just my profile, my taste profile, that it's so neutral and so dry. Um, probably a little grease, a little fatty food might be better if you're drinking mm -hmm. this type of a, a red outside, especially in the summertime. Yeah. Um, red meat, a fatty fish. I can see this cutting right through the fat, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because there's, it, there's nothing fighting with your, your palate in mm -hmm. this one. It's so neutral that it begs to be paired with something. Yeah, I, I would describe it as clean because it's, yeah, it's not giving me a whole lot. There are some interesting legs on it. I mean, the, the hmm, that's very interesting. I gotta say, I'm, I'm a little surprised by that one. I, I expected, I think I expected a little bit more peppery upfrontness, like the first. Yeah, the, the, and the tasting notes for this said lots of white pepper, and I'm not getting that. And it's probably because we had the Odaka first, and that's that was kind of overwhelming my palate at this point. You know, I, I'm gonna suggest something, Laura and Jim. I think we should try. This is sharp cheese on this side. This is a horseradish cheese on this side. I think we're gonna try a piece of okay. cheese, and Jim's gonna give me a bigger, I'll pour, give you a bigger pour than he gave me last time. <laughs> Because I think this is the kind of wine, thank you, Jim, that just begs for a dairy product. Yeah, no, see that to me, it takes better out of it. Uh, better's not it the does. right word. It's, yeah, it's a rounder experience. It, by the way, if you don't eat dairy, I'm sorry, you could have a crack. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. But it does taste better with a piece of, of cheese, mm -hmm. a stronger mm -hmm. cheese. So that to me just says, once again, for me, have something fatty or a little bit on the 
yeah. that side to drink that wine. Yeah, and a lot of wines need some kind of food to, to bring out the full experience mm -hmm. of the wine, to, to bring the fruits forward, to kind of mute some of the, the harsher notes. And I know so we've done a lot of shows where sometimes it's, we want to have food on it. It's tough to do a show in 29, 28 minutes, eat food and drink wine. Um, but a, a lot of the shows we've done that have had these type of reds especially pair so wonderfully with the right kind of food, mm -hmm. especially, you know, I know you made your crostinis, which everybody has heard about <laughs> time and time again. But Wait, we've got to do that for a show sometime. We, we haven't done the crostini show. <laughs> Not on right? the show, no. We've heard about the crostini show. You've eaten the crostini. I've, I've eaten the crostini. I've served on numerous occasions for you. But we have not done the crostini show, no. which I think our guests, our, our guests, our, both our guests and our audience, can you tell people what that is again? Okay, it's crostini okay. five ways. And what it's designed to do is to hit every different part of the tongue. So it's there's a, a salty... Crostini, there's a sour crostini, there's a bitter crostini, there's one that's unami, which is that kind of meaty texture. So it's it's designed to give you every different flavor profile that your tongue's going to experience. Right. And then you try and find the right wine that's gonna pair with that. So if, you know, if you're looking for something that goes, uh, if you're eating the bitter one, for example, you want a, a wine that's gonna have uh, some kind of fruit characteristics to, to balance that out. And it's fantastic. And, yeah. And actually, I think you know this last wine uh, that we're drinking right now would go well with the unami, which is the kind of meaty experience that you get. Uh, and and for that crostini, you're using a, I think a mushroom base. So Laura, in the future, when you're writing about your fantastic experience yes, on our show, which I and you're you're trying to give us Altoids, Altoids, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, Alkalates Maybe in your novel. <laughs> um, in your experience with wine drinking, you know, when it comes to red and so forth, do you like eating food yourself? Um, with with wine, you just like. I love just like uh, cheese and crackers. I That's the standby. And yeah. if I go out, if I'm having, but right now, I'm just kind of on the lower fatty thing. And as you're talking about that, I thought, well, I need to stay with the Udaka okay. for the moment because right. at least for me, I'm trying to cut down in the moment. Well, you know, it's interesting you should mention that because yeah. I Jim, in the past, mm -hmm. I mean, a couple of years ago, we actually had some wines on the show. Which were actually lower in calorie, if mm. you recall. I think mm. you oh, brought the skinny the, girl. The skinny yeah. girl, and at least from my yeah. experience and your experience, they didn't taste very good. No, and that's you know that's mm. why my advice was go ahead and drink a regular glass of wine because a regular glass was I think 125 calories, and the skinny girl mm. was 100 calories. So you're, you're not, not saving a it. lot of calories, no. but you're dropping mm. off in quality so much. Right. It's a tough mm. call because I get it, you know, because there are calories mm. in wine, both white and red. And uh, you know, if you are watching your calories, but you still enjoy wine, how do you make the balance? What do you do? Mm -hmm. Do you eat less and drink more, or do you drink more and eat less? Yeah. Um, or you, know, you could do what we talked about earlier. You could make a spritz, which is going to be a lot of club soda in with the wine. So in that case, you know, you're, you're kind of watering down your alcohol, but at the same time, right. you can have a couple of more drinks because the the amount of calories you're getting in from the club soda is zero. Now, what about some of your big tastings uh, you've done up in Boston uh, the last few weeks? Um, anything going All, on up there? Always busy. Um, I'll actually be at the House of Blues this weekend. Mm -hmm. now, by the time the show airs, it will nice. already have come and gone. But, uh, yeah, they, they keep me busy up there. And what's, uh, what's actually big this summer? What are people drinking? They're drinking my Pavel. Well, of course on. they are. I'm silly <laughs> of, yeah. of course they are. I should have known better. But uh, whites, reds, uh, pretty much a pretty much even split. Yeah, I do, uh, and I still do a lot of tastings with uh, proseccos. So there's there's a lot of proseccos on the market these days. Well, I will say, uh, proseccos are huge now too. Yeah. And uh, Laura, have you drinking a lot of proseccos over the last uh, few months of summer? I've had very little over the summer to be honest. Really? Yeah. Well, that's a shame. So this was kind of, I, <laughs> long story, <laughs> it'll be in the next book. Yeah. <laughs> Do you generally like sparkling? But like no. anything with bubbles in it or so forth? Um, not really with, well. It depends? Yeah. Like no, if it's a party? It really or, does, yeah, it really depends. The thing mm -hmm. with Prosecco is you could pretty much drink that with anything though. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's one of those wines that just pairs with any occasion and any food and Hmm. I actually use, uh, I pair it with sushi. Mm -hmm. That's that's one of my favorite pairings. So I've got a few minutes left in the show. What would would you like to try again, um, Laura? Do you have any? I would try the Odaka. I definitely. knew that's where oh, we were going. I knew that was <laughs> I've been eyeballing it for a while now. <laughs> that's very interesting. I think this is the big that's winner. That was, yeah. yeah, just right off the get-go. Thank you, Jim. Even if I wasn't biased towards red, yeah. I would still, I just. You know, what's interesting works. is, you know, we've been doing the show for so many years is there's always usually one wine that people just say, oh yeah, I gotta have more, I gotta have more of that. Mm -hmm. And it's funny that it's that one. For me, I'm mm -hmm. gonna actually say it's the last one, only because of the neutrality of it. Okay. I, at this time mm -hmm. of year, 
if I'm going to drink a red, I like a neutral red, nothing that's going to overpower my taste buds. And I liked how that sort of came to life a little bit with the cheese yeah. and the fattiness. Close second would be everybody's favorite here on the end. Yeah, I just, I, was, I get so little from the, the last wine that I, I can't pick that as a, I, yeah, I'd have I to go didn't. to the Udaka. So we would say the, the, the last one is sort of like a mushroom. It just sort of will absorb <laughs> any food. That exactly. It's, it's, it's the just, mushroom yes. of the red tonight. Okay, that's fine. That's cool. Yeah, everybody loves a mushroom. <laughs> well, I can see why people like this one, though. Yeah, that peppery kick right good. in front that's, is really, really good. Mm-hmm. It stands out. So how many different types of reds right now for Portugal? Are you actually involved in? I mean, the wise how well, many our, are there? Our company represents over 650 different items, so it's you know, it's a lot of inventory to keep track wow. of, uh, and yeah. I'm still trying to drink my way through all of it too. Oh my so. goodness! <laughs> you know, we should say it's not just wine, right? You yeah, have we do spirits. we do liquors and spirits, uh, but hmm. for the most part, it's wine. And our you know, Portuguese wines are what we specialize in, so we probably have over 100, 150 Portuguese wines in our inventory, uh, and I I haven't had all of those. What is a high price point for Portuguese wine? Like, what could you spend on a Portuguese uh, wine? You could spend up to around $40. But, you know, when you're spending that much, you have to compare this to what you're going to get from Italy or France. You know, you're going to be spending two or three times as much if, if it's coming from Italy or France. So, you know, $40 for a Portuguese wine is, is probably comparable to a $100 French wine. That's very interesting. Yeah. That price point might scare some people because they might not know enough about Portuguese exactly. wine to dish it up, and they'd be exactly. missing something then. And, and they're looking at the bottle, and if the, if the grape varietals are listed, these are completely different grape varietals. They're not familiar with them. So, that, again, that's why people kind of steer clear of Portuguese wines, and they shouldn't. I mean, this, this is where, and I'll say it again, this is where the value is in the wine world right now. Yeah, and I would second that because uh, Portuguese wines, from my experience that I've had both with Jim and on my own, have been very drinkable, very enjoyable, yeah. and uh, certainly budget-friendly. Yeah. So, you know, we're winding down with the last minute or so of the show, Jim. I just wanted to say um, thanks for bringing this down tonight. I, it's my pleasure, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, thanks again to Sarmento's Imports for mm -hmm. uh, giving us the supplies for tonight. And Laura, thank, thank you me. for uh, you know coming in tonight. I, I know thank we've you. talked before on, on LinkedIn, and I know uh, you've mm -hmm. been wanting to be on the show and, and drink <laughs> with us. And I hope you've enjoyed your first experience I with have. drink with two guys and a lot of wine. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. <laughs> we always like having people on the show that haven't had the wines before, <laughs> so that, that's been very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. so, so thanks again. So thanks for watching. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And until next time, keep, keep both of us in your, your wine, wine cellar. cellar.